the entire psalm. And in so doing, you got a good idea or thought about what the Bible means to the Lord. When the Lord said, I will cause everyone small and great to bow their head and bend their knee at the name of Jesus Christ. And then he says, and I will magnify my word above my name. He places an intrinsic value, a a significant amount on the value of what is sitting in your lap. If every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is God to the glory of God the Father. That's everybody. And then he makes the statement, I'll magnify above my name that everybody bows to the book that you've got in your lap. Amen. It gives us an assurance that he really does care about us. Because he gave us something that he's saying to you, listen, you may think I'm great, but I'm going to leave you something that I'll magnify, I'll lift up, I'll exalt, I'll, I'll increase in its size above my name. So we look to the Bible in times of trouble and trial, tribulation, difficulty, problems. Unfortunately, we tend to look there during those times. The Bible is written in such a fashion as to comfort us during those times. Yes, it's true, we should be looking at it all the time, but isn't it great that even when you look at it during times of trouble, it still speaks to you. Amen. This psalm that we're going to read is what's called an orphan psalm. It's a psalm that you don't really know who penned it for sure. It could have been David. It could have been Daniel. It could have been Hezekiah. It doesn't say. It's like the passage in Mark chapter number 5 where the nameless woman with an issue comes to the Lord the name is not there for a reason because the Holy Spirit intends for you in time of trouble to be able to pin your name at the heading of this particular part of the passage. Much of the Bible is written in that format to help you to understand it's not just the things written in the Old Testament for our nurture and our admonition and for our learning and using like and as in the book of Hosea, but also for us to make the Bible personal for the situation that we're going through at the time. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that people quit being people when they get saved. You're still a people. Amen. And you still have feelings of hurt and fear and anxiety and frustration and irritation and agitation and anxiety and those kinds of things. And the Bible doesn't laugh, mock, or make fun of you. But He does give you the comfort of saying, I'm with you in spite of all the trouble. It's interesting to me that when you look at the Peter, when the time comes for him to ask for help, he says, Lord, save me. He doesn't say, Lord, I'm drowning in this abyss and this dark sea is about to assuage me in its grips and the icy cold black fingers of the grim reaper are going to take me to the depths and I'm going to drown. And I would appreciate it if you'd divest yourself of your clothing and jump in and haul me up and save me and I would be eternally and forever grateful if you would ever do... You know what he says? Help. You know what this psalm is? Help. It's just help. It's just when I've done all I can do. Help. Prayed that a lot this past few days. Help. I don't have any flowery words. You know what's going on. You're hearing all... I'm just saying help. Sometimes we forget that God is not a priest, a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling, the feelings, the feelings of our infirmities. Sometimes... We think we're approaching the throne room and the prayer begins to be more about how we formulate the words as opposed to just, I'm in a mess. Would you help me out? My kid has gone prodigal. My grandkids are acting like they have got no sense at all. I don't even know if they're human. They must be aliens. I look at their head at nighttime and I can't find the 666, but I know it's in there somewhere. Lord, help. Lord help. Watch. This is what the psalm is. We'll just read a few verses here. I'll let you be seated. The Bible says in verse number 81, My soul fainteth for salvation, but I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle in the smoke. Yet do I not forget thy Statutes. Come to verse number 86. All the commandments are faithful. They, per they persecute me wrongfully. Help thou 
me. Personal. Selfish. Help me. It's the airplane theology. Before you help somebody else, put the mask on yourself. Brother Larry, I sure am glad you and Miss Trish are feeling better and back among the living. And we sure appreciate you continuing to pray. And how about you ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Lord, we're grateful to be here this morning. Thank you for a place to come and worship you and lift you up. Thank you for the brethren. Lord, thank you for the church, the church building. God, thank you for a place that we find our preacher, Lord, that has studied out the message for this hour. We give you the glory for that. And in the same breath, God, we pray for those that are afflicted. God among us, Lord, that are made up, even sedated. We thank you for the Holy Spirit of God, even in, even in that situation, God. You're there, you're alive yes. within them, God, and speaking yes. to them. Right. We give you the glory for all you do for us. We thank you for stirring and walking among us, Lord, for dealing with our hearts and helping us through the, through the word. God, and strengthening us, God, in, in uh, distressed times. We thank you, Lord, for the unity, the power that we feel, the strength that we feel when we're with the brethren in church. We thank you for that. Thank you for your word as it's preached, God, the help that it is to us as it goes into our souls and, and feeds us and strengthens us. I pray you'd help our preacher, your preacher, give him the words, God. Help his voice to be clear, his mind to be clear, great clarity. I pray, God, for him. You might use it one more time in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Can be seated. I see a number of things that speak to me. I'm trying to get past reading the Bible for the benefit of others or to use the Bible to see others in so that I can justify myself. This time through when I'm reading the Bible, I start off with, Lord, help me. Sometimes the diagnosis is a difficult process. Yes. Sometimes with me, the Lord's bedside manner is not, shall we say, conducive to a great, kind, friendly sort of a deal. Sometimes he just is like, I've told you this about ten times and I'm going to tell you one more time, but, but I'm tired of flowering it up. Yes. 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 I'm, I'm going to tell you straight up, this is what the problem is. And you can't build a bridge and get over yourself. I can't help you. Amen. Sometimes when Dr. Jesus comes by my room, it's like you're surprised you're laying here when I told you a long time ago, if you didn't stop, this is where you're going to be. Right, Did you think I was lying or I told you that to hurt you? And no, sir. Okay. And then when you recognize it was me, then the Lord said, okay, now we're going to see if we can do what we can do to help you. I'm reading this passage and I, I see some things that stand out. First of all, the individual that writes it, whoever it may be, is in need of salvation. Now you understand because you're Bible believers and you rightly divide the Bible that salvation in the Bible is not always salvation from hell. It is in a lot of cases. This psalm is written as if someone is already saved from hell. It is written from the standpoint of even a Bible believer, even a Christian, even a saved person has to say, Lord, this situation I'm in is bigger than me. It's more than me. I got to have some supernatural intervention. I need you to save me, not from hell. That's been done. But I need to save you from the situation or the circumstances that I'm in. I need you to supernaturally intervene in this situation because I'm like a bottle in the smoke. I didn't intend to be in the smoke. Somebody hung me out to dry and left me hanging out there and smoke is an unusual thing if you study much about it. The reason that people often die and sometimes die from smoke inhalation is not just inhalation is not just because of the the gray or the black the sooty stuff the petroleum products or whatever that get in coat their lungs it's because of the particulate that is inside the molecules that make up the smoke smoke becomes a carrier for every kind of uh, of, of uncleanness that is in the product that is being burned Every kind of uh, toxin, every kind of, uh, of thing that that 
fire has now produced is now being consumed and the matter that once was has now been turned into tiny microscopic particulate that can find its way into the smallest crack, the smallest crevice, the smallest little weakness. It can work its way in there. As a matter of fact, during a house fire, that smoke can cause smoke damage that will actually affect structure even though the structure hasn't been burned but the smoke has gotten in to the makeup of the wood and as a result the particles of acid and the particles of, of debris that have been burned have now continued to cause that wood to rot because it's being eaten away from those tiny little particles and over time the smoke damage that has been done to the structure all of a sudden causes the house to crumble because smoke carries little tiny things with it. They tell me wildfire smoke is more dangerous than people think it is because it's burning off debris and it's burning off a wood and things like that. They think, well, it's not a big deal. The smoke can actually get into and behind and we'd have to have Brother Kevin to talk to him about it, but it can actually get in and get behind uh, electrical boxes and get into the wiring and the acid can eat on the connections until eventually it actually, smoke can actually cause a fire. I guess I'm trying to say to you that smoke inhalation is a, a bad deal and can be dangerous. It causes, first of all, for your eyes to burn. You ever been in real trouble and real trial and the next thing you know, tears begin to find their way down your cheeks? You ever been in a bad, smoky situation and the first thing you're trying to do is you're trying so hard to see but your eyes are burning so bad the tears are beginning to flow and the tears are there to wash the smoke out so you can open the eyes but nonetheless he said I'm like a bottle in the smoke it says to me he's distraught He's discouraged. He is depressed. He's upset. He's thinking this is a bad situation. I got, I'm like a bottle in the smoke. I can't see where I'm going. I can't see what's going on. I'm stagnated. I'm stuck. I'm just hanging here in the smoke. I can't put out the fire. I can't stop the smoke. I'm here. It's drying me out. It's shriveling me up. It's smudging me. It's making me smell like smoke. It's overwhelming me. It's overcoming me. Really, smoke doesn't care who or what it attaches to, but once it gets on you, it's really, really hard to get off of you. I'm like a bottle, he says, in the smoke. And he said, I need salvation. I don't know if the psalmist was maybe reading about Elijah after Carmel being under the juniper tree and saw where the angel of the Lord stepped in to help Elijah in his moment of trouble. I don't know if he might have been reading about Daniel and thinking how the Lord stepped in and visited Daniel uh, in the lion's den. Or maybe the three Hebrew children, since he's talking about fire and smoke, about them being in the fire and about their clothes not smelling like the smoke. I don't know if he was reading about the woman in Mark chapter number 5 who simply said a nameless woman saying, man, I'm in a dire situation and I've got major issues. I don't know what he was reading, but I think he might have read, these people got some help. Lord, do you think you could help me? Let me not question your spirituality this morning. Let me not try to put you to some spiritual test or spiritual reckoning to understand that every one of us has a breaking point. Every one of us has a point where we can become so disillusioned that we completely lose sight of what's going on because we're so surrounded by smoke, we don't know which way is up. I remember taking off one time from a particular city and we were getting ready to go and a big thunderstorm had come out and the skies were just black and very foreboding and off in the distance you could see the, the, the rumble, I mean the, the cloud, the lightning flashing and so on and so forth and the rain was coming down and pelting the airplane and we had just a little small break there and it was dark. It was 12 o'clock in the daytime. So the sun should have been out. But I mean it was pitch dark, man. I mean the lights were on inside the plane to be able to walk down the aisleway. And we got ready to take off and I'm thinking, I'm not really so sure about this. And the captain said to him you know, very kindly, you know, after your seats and tray tables are up in the upright position and so on and so forth, he came on and he said, buckle up, it's going to be a rough ride in the ascension. And I thought, thanks for the warning, but, you know, maybe I wish I didn't have the window seat right now. And we took off and it was a rough ride until we crested about 15 or 16,000 feet and all of a sudden we broke through that 
gloominess. We broke through that darkness. We broke through that foreboding sky. The lightning flashes had ceased and the thunder was no longer rolling. The wind was not blowing in any which way you could even discern or tell. We broke out literally like somebody flipped on halogen lights and the sun was shining bright and the clouds from down underneath that were so dark, so black, so foreboding, seeming to bring about trouble and tribulation, all of a sudden were one of the most beautiful sights I had ever seen as the sun reflected off the top part of those white, fluffy, bunny-tailed cotton balls that were floating all around the sky. And you would not have known that a minute before it was black and looked like we wouldn't even be able to get out. And then when we broke through Amen. and saw what God sees, Amen. that while we're looking up, it's a glass darkly and we can't get it and we don't understand it. And God said, man, if you could see what I see... It's beautiful and it's bright and it's sunny on the other side. But it's hard, isn't it, sometimes? You know, when the money fails, when things don't work out the way you had them planned, when your job fails, when you wind up losing your physical ability. David said, my strength fails. David had been so strong, he killed a giant, a bear, and a lion. Say what you want to, he was a man. David went out and by himself slew 200 Philistines as a wedding gift. Thought nothing of it. Hey, bring us 100. David said, hey, I'll up the ante, I'll bring you 200. Thought it nothing to run and to rule an entire nation. Yet in Psalm 70, David said, my strength is failing. In Psalm 38, he said, my bones are broken. He begins to get weak in the last days and they say, hey, just to bring you warmth, old man, we'll bring you Abishag just to keep you warm. Not because of anything illicit, just to try to warm you up because your life is beginning to ebb away. And David, who was a man after God's own heart, who was one of God's favorites, said there's some times and certain things that I go through where i got to have supernatural help. And if God doesn't step in and help me, I'm like that bottle in the smoke. I'm drying up. I'm shriveling up. I'm becoming like a prune. Old age does that to you. You look in the mirror one day and you're thinking, when did that happen? Your skin looks like crepe paper. This ain't just women. And you used to, you know, that skin used to kind of be filled out a little bit. It was kind of, I'm not talking about here, I'm talking about, you know. And you look in there and it's like this bone with something hanging on it. And you're thinking, when did that happen? And then you go down to pick up a box and your back goes, uh-uh. And you're like, man, I used to pick that up with one hand. I mean, I could straight leg and bend over and pick it up. And now it's kind of like, you got a dolly? Honey, you only got to carry it from the back of the car to the kitchen. I know. I, well, it's still in the car. I'm thinking about how to get it in there. Can we get a conveyor belt? Maybe I'll call one of the guys that can help us get in. You say, well, what happens? You start to shrivel up. Your strength fails. Old age comes knocking. And you try your best to keep it at bay. You work out a little bit. And you walk a little. And you run a little. But no matter what you do, he runs faster. And weighs more. And you stand there and you're thinking to yourself, what happened? The Lord said, strength's failing. Can't quite do what you used to do. Works on your pride. But how about this? He also said, his spirit failed. The way you think. You get old, you get overly cautious. You get old and you learn what pain can do to you. You get old and you begin to think, man, what you used to not even think anything about, the pavement's wet. It's kind of like, oh, I don't know if I want to go out there. You check to see if you got the grippers on your shoes and make sure because you're thinking, if I fall, I may fall and not get back up. Things begin to change emotionally between your ears. When the reality comes about, you're dying. You cross over that 40 threshold and 
Things are behind you enough in the past and you begin to look at the ages of people dying and you start recognizing it's not the norm for people to live to be in their 90s. And so you're thinking, well, I think I'll at least make 80. By the time you're 50, you're thinking, I might make 70. By the time you're 60, you're thinking, I hope I make 70. Because your mind starts playing trouble, playing tricks on you. You get overly careful. You get really cautious. You begin to try to ensure your own safety and your own security. And then all of a sudden when it falls apart, guess what happens? You can't even see it when it comes on you because somebody somewhere started a fire. And you're not in the fire, you're in the smoke. And your eyes are burning. And you can't see. You have no idea what he is doing. You can't make any sense of it. You can't get any light. You say, why? Even if you could, there's no way to see no matter how much light you have. In smoke, you can't open your eyes very long because your eyes are so burning. They're so occluded by the smoke that you can't keep them open long enough to see the path that you're on. You know what you have to do? You just have to wait for them to clear out. You have to try to get yourself out of the smoke. I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen a lot in these last days. I've seen that happen a lot just before last March, not to give the pandemic any more than it deserves to get. But nonetheless, it has definitely, shall we say, changed how we see things. Because it's smoky. It's not clear. I hear the nomenclature, welcome to the new norm. We don't even know what the norm is anymore. Because it changes when you're in the smoke. You can't see and you get just a little bit of a change and you don't realize that while you're in the smoke, you're not only not able to see, it's drying you out. Spiritually, we become very, very dry because we're so consumed trying to make sense of things we cannot see the end of. We do not know what is going on no matter how much we try to claim. We know the answer and what's happening. There is no answer. We cannot see. And during that time, the fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty begins to dry us out spiritually. And we're like Elijah at the dead end and the detour and the dry brook. And the brook is dried up and we're like... Lord, what are we going to do now? And he gives him one command. He doesn't say, go over there and tell that preacher. Go over there and tell that king. Go over there and see that prophet. He said, go see that old woman. See the old woman? Yeah. Ask her for a biscuit. You mean all the light I'm getting right now in this smoky haze that I'm in, this... Three and a half years I have been over by the brook. Now the brook's dried up. Go ask a woman for a biscuit. Yep. Amen. The hole dried up, didn't it? Yep. You're hungry, aren't you? Do you think that when Elijah walked away from the brook Cherith that he saw everything out to the chariot? Or do you think that he might have thought, are you, are you serious right now? Well, yep. you, I, I mean, are you kidding me? You've been feeding me every day with ravens and a babbling brook. And now you want me to go ask somebody for the meal. He did not know it was her last meal. He asks her first, what are you doing? She said, I'm gathering sticks. What in the cat hair for? I'm going to make a fire. Why? I'm going to make a biscuit. I got just enough flour and just enough oil to make one more biscuit and I'm going to get half my boy's going to get half That'll be the last meal we'll have and then eventually we're going to starve to death. Now that preacher's thinking, the light he gave me, the clarity he gave me in the smoke was ask a woman for a biscuit, but he didn't tell me it was going to be her last one. See, maybe he had grown accustomed to the fact that every day when he got up, the ravens had dropped off McDonald's or Hardee's. Or whoever, whatever, all organic, vitality bowl, full of fruits and grains and vegetables. And I don't know what they brought. Apple pie. 
Ice cream. I don't know. And every day the brook was babbling. He wasn't warned that the brook was going to stop babbling the next day. He woke up. He ate, went to the brook and like, call the plumber. Get Brother Robert over here. Something's wrong. Something's, something's messed up here. It ain't the septic tank. That's working good. I need some water. Got to brush my teeth, comb my hair. I'm 80% water. I got to have something to drink. I'll be dehydrated. The Lord didn't tell him when he turned off the spigot. He didn't tell him go to the headwaters. He didn't tell him go clear out the area where it was bubbling up. He said, go see a woman. What? Don't tell me he didn't think it. He may not have said it, but don't tell me he didn't think. Go see a woman. Yeah, ask her to give you a biscuit. It seems so minuscule. It seems so small. Small. We read over it so fast in the passage to not recognize what a trial of the faith of that man when he said, go see her for the biscuit. Then he finds out that it's her last biscuit. Don't try to make it any more than it is. I guarantee you it bothered him to ask for her biscuit. He's saying, feed me. I'm trusting God. It's kind of like, oh man. What a great time for him to say, Lord, that's asking a little bit too much of me. And you didn't recognize, didn't see the dominoes fall and the cards in place and understanding that if he did what God told him to do, God was going to take care of that woman and her boy. He didn't show him that. He just said, this is what I need you to do. Ask her for the biscuit. Don't tell me he wasn't in a grind. Don't tell me he wasn't thinking to himself, man, I mean, we read through the passage like we're running the Kentucky Derby, but he comes through there and he's, what are you doing? Making sticks and sticks. What are you doing it for? Going to make a fire? Why are you making a fire? Going to make a biscuit? What are you going to make a biscuit with? Some flour, some meal, and some oil. Enough for one more biscuit. And you're fixing to get it. What's missed a lot of times in that passage is the faith of that woman. Now think about this for just a minute if you would. If there was ever an illustration of a bottle in the smoke, it's that woman. Don't tell me she hasn't been praying. Lord, we are at the bottom of the barrel. We ain't got enough meal except for one more bit, not biscuit each. We got enough for one more biscuit. It ain't a cat head. One more biscuit. Lord, can you help me? Lord, can you provide for me? Lord, can you do something for me? Lord, would you please, I've tried to be faithful and my dependence on you is depend, my son depends on me. And Lord, we've trusted there's a great famine in the land and we don't know what we're going to do. Lord, would you please do something? Oh, here comes the preacher. This is great. Hey, sis, how you doing? Fine. What you doing? Making a biscuit. Why? Gonna feed me and my boy. We're gonna die. We already know what's happening. She doesn't say, I don't know why God's gonna kill me. I don't know why God's doing this to me. She just says, matter of factly, we're gonna eat it and die. Not because the biscuit was poisoned, but because of the last meal. Here's the help that came, and if you tell me it wasn't kind of smoky, don't you tell me that when he said to her, Give me that biscuit. That she didn't think, you stinking Baptist fat preacher, you. You already got everything in the world, now you're going to take the meal off my table? You would have thought that, wouldn't you? It's okay, I would have thought that. I'm like, she says, okay. Gets a cruise of water. Feeds him the biscuit. And after he's done, he says, go uh, check the barrel. He said, preacher, I done turned that thing upside down. I banged it on the counter. I mean, I got every last grain of that flour. I got that little bit of oil over there, a little bit of butter, a little bit of Crisco, a little bit of lard. I got that last little bit out. I took my finger and run it around there and slid it off on the edge of the bowl. 
I heated it up a little bit. And what was left in there just kind of running a little. I don't, I, that's it. There ain't no more. He said, well, just go check. Mm. Yep. Don't tell me it wasn't a little hazy, yeah. a little smoky. Mm. What's that woman's name? That's observant. The Holy Spirit left it out for a reason. Because sometimes God asks you to do things in the midst of trouble and trials and tribulation to help other people and you're the one needing help. Yes. You don't even realize that during your trouble you are actually being a help, a benefit to somebody else eating your biscuit. Good, good, brother. And she fed the preacher. And God said, I sure appreciate you doing that. He's got some lessons to learn. You'd think after three and a half years, he would learn I couldn't provide. But he needs to put it to the test and learn also to be obedient and ask. Stay with me. The barrel of meal doesn't fail. Neither does the cruise of oil. She trusted the preacher to be able to feed her. So then in the passage when the boy dies, he was going to die anyway after he ate the last biscuit. But now they've been eating good and things have been going along fine and he dies anyway. And she comes and says, Preacher, I don't get it. I gave you my last biscuit. And God took care of us. Why did this happen to me? Watch. You know what he says in the passage? I don't have you turn there because I just, I want you to hear the story, okay? You know what he says in the passage? Give me the child. He didn't, she didn't realize that when she gave him the biscuit, she was trusting the Lord to provide a meal was the teaching lesson for the bigger thing. If I took care of you with the biscuit, I'll take care of you with your boy. See, it was kind of smoky. She didn't even know the value of the biscuit until she lost the boy. And now the preacher says, give me the boy. After that, the story ends. You say, why? That woman must have learned a lesson. But the time that she had with the preacher, you say, why? Because the Lord don't ever ask you for the boy till you've learned the lesson of the biscuit. Amen. Elijah goes on and preaches one of, if not the greatest message in all the Bible in front of an entire nation. I mean, literally, fire comes down in answer to his prayer. And within a matter of days, the preacher that had been provided for for three and a half years had taken the woman's biscuit and had the supernatural power through the Holy Spirit to raise that woman's son from death to life, to call down fire from heaven and to kill 450 prophets of Baal is now sitting under the juniper tree. It's kind of smoky. It's kind of hazy. It don't make sense. Lord, the way I had it drawn up, Israel is going to repent, get right. I'm going to be the prophet. And the king may be there, but he's going to be in submission to you. And the nation of Israel is going to be turned back to you. How could they reject that after that message? They said they would do it. We're on the right track. Disillusioned, or can I use the illustration of smoke got in his eyes. And before long, he gets a letter, and instead of it being an invitation to the palace, it's, this is how much we appreciate you. I'm going to kill you. It's interesting. John the Baptist had a similar problem. You ever read about it in, I think it's Mark chapter 7, 
when John the Baptist has called Herod out for his wickedness and called out Herodias and all the other stuff that has taken place there because she's with his brother and, and or is married to his brother and with him and John the Baptist calls them out for their sin and stuff and he winds up getting locked up in prison. And he's in prison and he says basically, now Lord, if you're the Messiah, I'm in prison, come get me out. Because I've read all the Old Testament passages that say that you're going to come, you're going to overthrow the Gentile government. Israel or Jerusalem is going to be the gem or the, the, the gemstone and the capital of everything in the earth. And the Jews are going to take over rulership. Oh, Lord, if there was ever a time that needs to be done, it's right now. And he sits in jail and it doesn't happen. This is the one that Jesus said, a born of a woman, there is no greater preacher than John the Baptist. That John the Baptist. Cousin to Jesus. That John the Baptist. Baptized Jesus. That John the Baptist. Jesus increases his ministry. John's ministry decreases. Recognizing who he is as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That John the Baptist. You know what he said? He sends his disciples to Jesus and he says, Are you him? Or are we looking for another one? Because what I've been reading about you is you're supposed to come in and you're supposed to take over the Gentiles and you're supposed to kick them off and we're supposed to be in charge and Israel's supposed to be restored and the desert's supposed to blossom like a rose and I got all the passages that say it's time for you to come and the Lord sends back and you've seen us do a lot of miracles, we're right on track. <laughs> and He doesn't deliver him. Lord, is it you or are we to look for another one? This isn't working up how I working out how I had it drawn up. No, I'm him. Well, you got a funny way of showing it. I'm still in prison. Yep. That's a blessing. See in glory. <coughs> Smoky. Not clear. He gets called up after a party. He's in the after party. Herodias' daughter has done her devilment and his head's laying on the chopping block. And John's not getting it. I'm, how does, if, if he's the Messiah, we're supposed to be in charge. I can't see it. There's smoke in my eyes. I'm dehydrated. I'm dead. I spent my whole life in camel skin eating bugs and honey and standing out there making a fool of myself standing in the middle of a muddy river and my end is this and the second that sword came across the back of his neck and his head fell into that basket John the Baptist said oh the smoke cleared oh wow I was blind what blinded you the smoke the smoke I the smoke of my own delusionment, disillusionment. I, I thought it was going to be this way. I didn't realize that all things work together for good to them who love God, them who are called according to His purpose. I didn't know God had a, a different plan than I did. It was smoky. I couldn't, I couldn't see it. I had to. Don't tell me there wasn't exercising by faith. People, I've heard preachers preach on sermons about the weakness of John the Baptist's faith. Is that you, or do we seek for another? Uh, be careful because John the Baptist is saying, it ain't working out how I thought it should work out. Right. And the Lord said, John, we're right on track. David. I just plan on doing what you're expecting in a couple thousand years. Right now to you, it's sort of smoky. Sword fell and Paul, John said, oh, oh, I see now. Lord, could I ask you a question? I know you're down there and I'm up here, but can I ask you? I know he's a father, but I know he's down there at the same time. But could, could I ask one of y'all a question? <coughs> Why didn't you show me that down there? And the Lord said, it wasn't for you to know. It was for you to trust me. Because smoke comes in our eyes sometimes to be a trial of our faith, to help us to understand God knows what he's doing, but you have to follow his leadership. I had a fireman friend of mine years ago, I, I never really was interested in going into house fires. That didn't, that didn't excite me at all. 
I had an experience down in Atlantic Beach where there was an old woman in a house and the fire department was late getting there and that kind of thing. And I went in there, thought I was, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. I was insane or something. I don't know. And I, I grabbed my raincoat of all things, that blue orange, orange on one side and blue on the other. And I went in there to try to find that woman and she met me coming in. So I didn't get in that far and it wasn't some big kind of a deal where I'm carrying this old woman out the door. She was coming out and cooking. It was kind of like, get out of my way, sonny, kind of deal. And I, I get back out there, and the whole left-hand side of that thing has just melted all over the place. I don't know if th that thing had melted into me. I'd have been like her when that candy burned her so bad and that kind of thing. I'm thinking to myself, what in the world were you thinking? So I was telling that to a fireman one time, and he said, well, here's the thing that happens. He said, two things happen that are really, really bad. He said, first of all, people don't realize smoke inhalation can lead to asphyxiation because CO2 builds up. You can't get rid of it quick enough. Then you pass out, and then you die. I said, well, that's good to know. He said, if you ever have to go into a burning house, I said, that's what we have you there for. He goes, yeah, but even with all the apparatus on, he said, you know what you have to learn to do? He, have to, he said, you have to learn smoke rises. He said, you have to realize that if you're going to go into a burning building, you've got to get way down low. He said, like on your belly. He said, because maybe even as little as two feet off the ground, you won't be able to see your hand in front of your face, but if you're all the way down on the ground... He said, you'd be surprised. You can see the floor and even the lights and you can find your way through there. If you're willing to get low enough, you can find your way in around in the yes, smoke. Good. Good. I said, I'll take your word for it. I don't really want to learn about that kind of stuff. But you know what I realize? I realize sometimes smoke comes into our life like it did in Elijah's life to get us down. Do you ever think that maybe Elijah might have come out like some of us? And instead of having a message for the king, if he hadn't have gone through the biscuit and the boy first, Ugh. did you ever think he might have come out and go, Yep, yeah, I'm Elijah. I've put on about 15 pounds while I've been out there in the wilderness. Don't know what's wrong with y'all. God's been taking care of me, feeding me every day. Three squares. Ravens bring it over. Hand delivered. Uber ain't got nothing on me. DoorDash. Grubhub, hey man, I get bird hub every day. I get water that tastes like Coca-Cola. I'm telling you, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, it's got I mean it's water with gas. I mean it's got it's got bubbles in it. It's it's uh it's uh, uh whatever that green one is. Perrier San Pellegrino Fancy water in a bottle, fizzing. But as soon as he came out of the wilderness, the Lord said, now you're going to have to depend on other people. You know what else he says to him? Last one and I'll be done. He goes into the cave and gets smoky again. He's looking for something. And he thinks it's in the earthquake and the fire and the high wind. And the Lord said, no, it's in the still small voice. And now he's going to put him to the test. He said, you know, Elijah, you've done pretty good working by yourself. But you need somebody. Yeah. You're good at helping others now, but you're going to have to have somebody help you. There's a boy over the horizon over there. He said, I want you to walk by and throw the mantle on him. And he said, I want you to humble yourself and say, I need help. Can't do it on my own. Elijah, the great man of God that went up on the mountain by himself, who said, I and I alone stand for you. And the Lord said, there are 7,000 people that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. <laughs> you ain't the only one. I know you think you are. He said, yeah, well, where were them jaybirds when I was up on the mountain and nobody showed up? He said, they're independent Baptists. They don't come to church on Sunday night. <laughs> he said, you're going to have to ask somebody to help you. You need somebody to carry water for you. You're getting old, boy. Getting smoky. Eyes aren't where they quite were. And when he does, he goes by and gets Elisha, and Elisha spends 10 years with him. And then the Lord said, time for you to go home. Preacher, what's the message? I don't know. You ever been, feel like a bottle in the smoke? Hung out to dry? No help? Can't see which way's up. Don't know which way's down. 
the particulate in the smoke is getting into every crack and crevice. And that smoke can sometimes carry bitterness into your heart and it can embed itself in there. And it can eventually corrode, rot, rust your way of thinking out to the point that you can't even see what God is trying to do. Smokes of trouble and trials, tribulation, difficulty, the drying out, the, the need for the drink of water. In every one of those three things that I gave you, there's an interesting thing. There's water by the brook. It dries up. She gives him water. You have to look at it. It's in there. It's a cruise of water. During the time of a famine and she had water. And the Lord inserts it into the passage for a reason. By the time he comes over there at the brook Cherith, you know what I mean? By the time he comes over there and after the Carmel, you know what happens? He goes out into the desert. And when he awakens the first time, by his head is a cruise of water. It wasn't just that Elijah was hungry, he was thirsty and didn't know it. He needed water to put out the fire that would clear up the smoke so he'd be able to see. He needed water to drown out that anger and bitterness that he felt toward the nation of Israel for not doing what they said they were going to do. Because listen, it made him look like he was no better than his fathers. That's reputation. And there's a cruise of water right there. I wonder why. In all three places, there's the need for the water. Just for the sake of illustration this morning, can I say this? Maybe the water was because he was dry and dehydrated. Maybe it was to aid him in putting out the fire that was causing the smoke. But no matter what, they tell me. I have some friends that they know how to cure meat the right way. I don't know what it is about the chemical makeup of smoke. I love it on barbecue. Why would you want to eat? It's just, I don't know, smoky barbecue. You take deer meat and pork butt, put it together and make sausage and then get that little smoky flavor in there. It's better than Jimmy Dean anytime. I don't want to go, I, I, you know, we used to go to this place down here on San Jose Boulevard. They had a problem with their vent. And so when you went in there, you smelled like you were on the grill instead of being there to eat. You walk, you walk out of there. Even back when I was a policeman, you go to this one particular place at Cotton's at 17th and Main. If she had that stuff cooking in there, you walk out of there, you smelled like a roast bar, uh, barbecue pork butt. That's true. And all day long, you smelled like that. It's kind of like you stayed hungry all day. I just got through eating and I'm still hungry. Why? I can still smell that barbecue. It's you roasting. The smoke would get in you, and for some reason it adds a real good flavor, but left too long, even though they're not on the fire. Smoke can do more damage over a longer period of time than fire. Fire burns quickly. Smoke deteriorates slowly over time and can dry out the person who gradually, like the frog in the boiling water, gets accustomed to being dried out, and before long... They're so dried out, they're shriveled up, they begin to crack just from being exposed to smoke, not the fire. And before long, if they don't recognize that and somebody comes along and cuts them down, and first of all, washes them and cleans them, and then takes some oil and makes them supple and fills in the cracks and crevices and all the places that the smoke was trying to get in and makes them usable again. If they just decide to stay in the smoke before long, they dry out. And once they dry out, they get out. Whoever penned this orphan psalm knew the principle, Lord, help me, I know where this is going to wind up I'm a bottle. I, I, there, I can't do anything myself. You got to help me. Help me. Psalms 116. He hears me. He helps me. And he holds on to me. But whoever wrote this, you know what he said? 
His enemies are causing problems. This has happened, that's happened. But do you know what he knew? He had enough sense to know within two verses. You know what he said? I need salvation. I can't do this by myself. That's the situation or circumstance that maybe some of you are in now, more than just the pandemic. Isn't it interesting that we are under the pandemic, the virus, the, the COVID, the, the SARS, COV2, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Isn't it interesting that your trouble in other areas of your life hasn't stopped just because of a big trouble in the whole world? I don't know about you, but my, it hadn't stopped for me. I mean, the same stuff is still going on. It's like that plus this. It's kind of like, could I just deal with this right now and the people that are dealing with this? And why are you still giving me all this other stuff? Well, the world didn't quit turning. I still get bills in the stinking mail. I'm like, hey, COVID, man. You know what I'm saying? Here's the mortgage payment. COVID, man. Oh, you should let me live for free. I can't leave my house. But it don't stop. You go do a funeral now. You can have ten people. What? You can't have church. That's all changing. It's loosening up now. But the same problems are still there. Here's the closing. Oftentimes the Lord allows the bottle to be in the smoke. And puts us in a situation that is beyond our control for our good. And if you will learn to say, Lord, help me and stop being so bullheaded and say, Lord, I got it. I don't need you. I'm good to go. Ain't that big of a deal. Uh-uh. It's get down low in the smoke and say, Lord, help me. I can't see. I'm blind as a bat flying backwards. I'm drying out. I'm losing my way. Help me. Help me. The Lord will swoop right down there and he take them tears. He said, I know that smoke caused you to cry. But them tears meant so much to me, I put them in a bottle. I know that smoke made you say why and where and how and when and even what. I let it come down and that smoke's pouring and I know you think it was terrible. And while you were trying to get that smoke out of your eyes, I had an angel taking those tears and putting them into a bottle because those tears that come from smoke are the most valuable thing in heaven. I place them up in a bottle. One day I'm going to say, i show you the evidence of smoke in her life. Can I show you the evidence of smoke in his life? Can I, can I show you how I saw that? See, it was really dark for them. But the way I was looking at it is, there's nothing prettier nothing brighter, nothing more glorious, and nothing that reflects my light better than those tears. I show you tears? Show you smoke in his eyes? Here it is. Paul says, we glory in smoke. Sorry, a little insertion there. We glory in tribulation, smoke in our eyes. And we can't see it. We don't understand it. And it doesn't make sense. And God said, hey, come here. Come here. See that jug over there? Yeah. They're going to cry a river. I want you to go down there and catch it. Yes, sir, he says. Makes a beeline. And by the time those first tears find their way out of your eyes and down your cheeks and begin to drip off your chin, the names are right there going, wow. I don't even know what that's like. I've never cried a tear in my life. 
I've never seen nothing like that in my life. Man, I wish I could experience that. And the Lord says, that's valuable. Put it right up there. Label it. Label it February the 7th, 2021. Put University Hospital, Baptist Hospital. Put the cemetery's address on there. Put the divorce decree on there. Put the debtedness in there. Just set it up there. Lord, how could that trouble be? Lord said, just wait till you see it from where I'm at. And when you see it from where I'm at, you'd be saying, Lord, I sure appreciate that smoke. It's hard to appreciate it now. You say, why? Burns your eyes, don't it? Keeps you from breathing, don't it? Hard to get a deep breath and smoke. Can't find your way. Knocks you to your knees. Dries you out. Not going to make it. The Lord said, yeah. Did you need something? Yes, sir, I need you. I like it. Help, Lord. He knows the rest of the sentence. He knows the rest of the sentence. He made you. Help, Lord. My marriage is a soup sandwich. You don't have to say anything. Just help. He knows. Just help. A preacher told me one time, I preached a little message on prayer, and I'm done. And I got done, and we were sitting, eating, talking, and he said, hey, brother, let's run something by you. I said, yes, sir, please. He said, you know, there's something to be said for vain repetition. I said, sir? He said, you know, you were, kind of, you were encouraging people just to keep asking. I said, yeah, the illustration I used was, knock and it shall be opened unto you. I said, he gives the importunity there in the passage where the person keeps knocking until somebody comes and answers the door. I said, I believe if a person is sincere that they just keep asking. He said, well, I I understand what you're saying, but we don't want to be Catholic in our theology. I said, I'm not Catholic, brother. But I said, I got to tell you, there's sometimes things that I've struggled with that I have to ask him more than once. And I've continued to ask him. And what I wanted to say was, is don't give me some theological dissertation. Because I've been in some trouble before. And I just come and ask what's on my heart. Help me. I don't think the Lord's like, that's one. That's two. I said, you know, sometimes I think it's because we continue to ask that the Lord sees that we're really serious. And I said, I can really tell about me what's important to me by how often I ask for God to help me with it. Well, he said, you make a point, but you're still young yet. That was over 20 years ago. These last few days... For the folks here, let alone the folks I know other places, same prayer. Eye surgery, people in hospitals, families in trouble, same thing. Didn't you just pray that yesterday? Yep. I've been praying it every hour. Same thing. Yep. Why? Lord matters to me. Help me. Maybe it's just for me because it makes me feel better. Because I cotton pick and can't do nothing else. Lord, help me. What else can you do? Nothing. Help me. Please, sir, with all due respect. Help me. Help me. Help me. 
help me. And if I get in trouble and get my hind end dusted in front of that theologian when I get up there, then so be it. But right now, all I know to do for you is say, Lord, help them. Lord, help them. Lord, help them. I, I can't answer all their questions. I can't be there for all their trouble. I can't even be in the hospital with you when you go in the hospital. They won't even let you in. Any time they needed a preacher, it's then. Let me go. Well, you might get, I want to go. You can't. Give me a suit. Can't. So what can I do? Lord, help them. You say, do you understand it? Mm -mm. Got to be honest with you. I look across this congregation and you know what I see? A bunch of smoke. <laughs> I can't explain why, folks, you've been through what you've been through. I couldn't give you an answer for nothing. If you held a gun to my head, I couldn't give you an answer for it. I can't even make sense of it. I'm not stupid enough to even try. But I know somebody that does know it. Amen. So here's the prayer. Lord, help me. Or Lord, help them. Or Lord, help me. Or Lord, help them. He knows the rest of the story. Yes, Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. <clears throat> maybe just ponder for a moment. I'm going to close in prayer. But maybe you feel like that bottle in the smoke. Maybe you feel like you're in somebody else's fire and trouble and difficulties come your way and it don't make sense and you can't see any way out of it. Don't know if it'll ever end. Grief has blinded you and bitterness or frustration or physical ailments, psychological troubles and you can't see. I'm going to show you what to pray. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Not Lord, help me to see. Lord, help me to understand. Lord, help me. I don't have enough sense to see. Help me. Father, I'd ask now as we close in this service today, I thank you for the endurance and the long-suffering of your people. I thank you for their willingness to come. They're looking for something, Lord. It's a smoky time in which we live. Anybody is foolish, including preachers, to think that we understand the haze that is about us right now. We try so hard to identify it instead of just saying, Lord, help me through it. I'd ask you, Lord, that you might help those that are in dire straits at this moment and comfort those that are trying to help others get through situations. Be with our brothers and sisters some of which are cooped up at home for the first time ever because they can't get out. They're too sick to get out. They miss being together with us and wish they could be but can't be. And those that are among us that are in hospitals, relying on God-given man's invention to keep them around, to get them well, but we realize, Lord, without the touch of the great physician, that no machine, no person has the ability to sustain life. We're asking you to do that. Amen. We're asking you to comfort those that are listening right now and waiting for the good news, and waiting for Lazarus to come out of the tomb. We thank you, God, for that having already occurred on many an occasion. Lord, as bad as we hate to do it, we're back again. When our hands are turned upward, our faces towards you to say, help us again, Lord, again, again, help us. I'm so grateful that your storehouse never runs out of help. I'm so grateful that your hands never get tired of picking up and your arms never go tired of holding. Your never legs never get weak from walking with us and carrying us and caring about us. And that's now, Lord, that you'll help us. We're just bottles in smoke. If not now, we have been, and if we haven't been, we will be. Pray, Lord, that you'll help us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.